Well, good afternoon, everyone. And for those of you who are traveling, welcome home. Um, accurate information is vital to the health of any democracy. Uh, it helps citizens understand the issues and effects uh, and events that are affecting their lives. It empowers them to engage meaningfully in their communities, their country, the world. When state or non-state actors spread disinformation, material deliberately meant to deceive or divide our public, they attack the very foundations of our free and open society. In March, I laid out the comprehensive steps the administration is taking to address this threat to our national security and to our national fabric. First, we're building a more resilient global information system where objective facts are elevated and deceptive uh, messages gain less traction. Uh, we're doing that by promoting policies and programs that protect a free, vibrant, and independent press and that foster greater civic and media literacy so that people can better distinguish fact from fiction. Second, we're working to expose, to disrupt, to deter disinformation. Through the State Department Global Engagement Center, we're coordinating government-wide and with other countries to identify, to analyze, to undercover attempts by governments and non-state actors to manipulate information. Third, we're taking steps to hold accountable those who weaponize disinformation to undermine our democracy. That's what we did just last week when the State Department, the Justice Department, the Treasury Department, the FBI took a series of coordinated actions to counter Russian influence and interference in our elections and in our democracy. In addition to imposing sanctions, visa restrictions, and other measures, the State Department also designated the Russian state-funded and directed media company, Rosia Segodnya, and five of its subsidiaries, including RT, under the Foreign Missions Act. As a result, these actors are now required to notify the State Department of all personnel working in the United States, as well as their property. We took these steps based on our conclusion that Rosia Segodnya and these five subsidiaries are no longer merely fire hoses of Russian government propaganda and disinformation. They are engaged in covert influence activities aimed at undermining American elections and democracies, functioning like a de facto arm of Russia's intelligence apparatus. Today, we're announcing that these Kremlin-backed media outlets are not only uh, playing this covert influence role to undermine democracy in the United States, but also to meddle in the sovereign affairs of countries around the world. Thanks to new information, much of which originates from RT employees, we know that RT possessed cyber capabilities and engaged in covert information and influence operations and military procurement. As part of RT's expanded capabilities, the Russian government embedded within RT a unit with cyber operational capabilities and ties to Russian intelligence. RT's leadership had direct, witting knowledge of this enterprise. Russian government actors incorporated the cyber capabilities of this unit within RT in the spring of 2023 which is focused primarily on covert influence operations around the world. Under the cover of RT, information produced through this unit uh, flows to Russian intelligence services, Russian media outlets, Russian mercenary groups, and other state and proxy arms of the Russian government. One of its projects is a large online crowdfunding program in Russia, operating within RT and through social media channels to provide support and military equipment, supplies, weaponry, to Russian military units in Ukraine. This includes sniper rifles, suppressors, body armor, night vision equipment, drones, radio equipment, personal weapon sites, <coughs> diesel generators. While the crowdfunding campaign is out in the open, what's hidden is that this program is administered by the leaders of RT. Last week, our government revealed how RT launders information operations through unwitting Americans to covertly disseminate Kremlin-produced content and messaging to the American public. Today, we're exposing how Russia deploys similar tactics around the world. In Germany, for example, RT covertly runs the Berlin-based English language platform RED, a successor to the now defunct RT link platform Redfish. RT also secretly runs the online platform African Stream, across a wide range of social media platforms. 
Now, according to the outlet's website, African Stream is, and I quote, a pan-African digital media organization based exclusively on social media platforms, focusing on giving a voice to all Africans both at home and abroad. In reality, the only voice it gives is to Kremlin propagandists. RT's expanded covert capabilities allow it to deepen coordination with traditional Russian intelligence services as they work to manipulate the outcome of democratic elections in the United States, but also around the world. For years, RT and its employees have coordinated directly with the Kremlin to support Russian government efforts to influence Moldova's elections, including the October 2024 presidential election. RT's leadership has leveraged Russian state-funded and directed media platforms to attempt to foment unrest in Moldova, likely with the aim of causing protests to turn violent. We believe RT will almost certainly leverage its expanded covert capabilities to coordinate with Russian intelligence services to try to manipulate the outcome of Moldova's upcoming election. As a result of these findings, today, we're imposing sanctions on three entities and two individuals for Russia's covert global influence operations, including interference in Moldova's democracy and its upcoming elections. The actions we're exposing today and the actions we exposed last week do not uh, uh, incorporate the full scope of Russia's efforts to undermine democracies. Far from it. We're Russian weaponization disinformation to subvert and polarize free and open societies extends to every part of the world. In response, today, the United States, the United Kingdom, and Canada are launching, uh, launching a joint diplomatic campaign to rally allies and partners around the world to join us in addressing the threat posed by RT and other machinery of Russian disinformation and covert influence. Under the uh, using, excuse me, that the internet, intelligence diplomacy uh, has become a hallmark of our administration. Uh, I've instructed U.S. diplomats around the world to share the evidence that we've gathered on RT's expanded capabilities and the ways it's being used to target individual countries and the information inf ecosystem that we share. Now, each government, of course, is going to decide how it responds to this uh, threat. But we urge every ally every partner, to start by treating RT's activities as they do other intelligence activities by Russia within their borders. Now, let me be very clear. The United States respects and champions freedom of expression, even when it comes to media outlets that wittingly spread government propaganda, and will continue to lead the world in defending and promoting media freedom. But we will not stand by as RT and other actors carry out covert activities in support of Russia's nefarious activities. And we'll continue to respond forcefully to Moscow's playbook of aggression and subversion, one that includes invading sovereign nations, fomenting coups, weaponizing corruption, carrying out assassinations, meddling in elections, and unjustly detaining foreign nationals. The great U.S. Supreme Court Justice Louis Brandeis once said, as is well known, sunlight is the best disinfectant. RT wants its new covert intelligence capabilities, like its long-standing propaganda and disinformation efforts, to remain hidden. Our most powerful antidote to Russia's lies is the truth. It's shining a bright light on what the Kremlin is trying to do under the cover of darkness. Taking action, together with our allies and partners, uh, to address this threat to our democracies is an effective way of pushing back. And today, we're taking an important step in that direction. Uh, one final related note uh, on a more uplifting subject. Um, a little bit earlier today, I had the opportunity to sit down with Evan Gerskovich. Uh, first time I've had a chance to see him since he was freed. Uh, we were joined by one of his colleagues from the Wall Street Journal, which was such a tenacious champion, along with his family, in pressing for Evan's release. I know uh, a number of you know Evan. Uh, anyone who knows him can attest to this. He's incredibly warm. He's got a great sense of humor. But maybe the most striking part of spending time with Evan is simply how wonderful it feels to see him free, home, where he belongs. Um, I also keep returning to the fact that Evan, on the form that Russia forced him to fill out before he was released, asked for an interview with Vladimir Putin, always on the job. We make a lot of great things in this country, but one of the greatest things we make 
It's our journalists. Their professionalism, your professionalism, the unshakable commitment to seeking the truth is a service not only to our people and our democracy, it's a service to the entire world. Evans' freedom is also a reminder of all Americans who are still held hostage or wrongfully detained. And as I said, when we first secured the release of Evan, of Paul, of Alsu, and others, for them and for their families, uh, those who remain detained, there are tough days uh, when they will question if they ever get their freedom back. Uh, my pledge to them is the same one that I made to, to Evan and to the dozens of other Americans whose release we've secured these last few years. We've not forgotten you, we will not forget you, and we will not rest until we get you home where you belong. Thanks very much. Okay, for the Rush Show, uh, we have a couple of officials here. Jim O'Brien, who is the Assistant Secretary for the Bureau of European and Eurasian Affairs, and Jamie Rubin, the Director of the Global Engagement Center, who will take questions uh, about the announcement the Secretary just made. And then at the end of that, if you have any other remaining questions, which I'm sure you won't about the rest of the world, I'm happy to come back up and, and take some of those. So, Jim, Jamie. Thank you, Matt. Ask us a question. Yeah, go ahead. Um, yeah, yeah, sure. Right. Uh, thanks for doing this. I, just, just to be clear, I mean, what exactly is new from 10 days ago, or not even 10 days ago, when DOJ announced and, and yourselves announced to haul these series of sanctions against RT, against uh, uh, the, the group company, the Russia Signodia? Uh, what exactly is different? Today and yeah. the reason why the secretary would come out and yeah and speak about this. This is about the rest of the world. So last week was very focused on activities in the U.S. Here we're talking about covert activities, attempting to subvert democracy and manipulate information environments in the rest of the world. And um, Jamie may have some examples of this, but I just want to call attention to one of the sentences the secretary said. He's instructed diplomats globally to share information we have about what Russia is doing and to engage with our partners in trying to remove this threat to democracy and accurate information around the globe. So part of what we will be doing picking up from this is to engage globally and systematically with our partners over time to keep going at the structure Russia's built to influence operations around the world. And so you'll see more of this over time as we work, and we'll be working with our partners. This whole initiative began um, with the Secretary speaking with a number of our partners. The EU, as you know, has banned RT from functioning in Europe. Um, he spoke with the Canadian Foreign Minister and with uh, Minister Lamy in Great Britain when he was there earlier this week, and they've indicated a strong interest in being partners on this, and we will work with more and more countries over time to address this. So that's the main difference, domestic, now global. Let me just add a couple of points to, to what Jim said. First of all, you'll get a fact sheet. You'll see a lot of detail. You'll see incredible detail about the way in which RT has become a clearinghouse for a set of covert operations, covert influence activities, intelligence operations de facto in country after country after country. There's an example in Argentina where they're uh, uh, trying to uh, affect government policy. There's a uh, threat in the South Caucasus where they will use these tools to affect uh, governments there. There are examples in France, there are examples in Germany. Now, you may not find it uh, dramatic, but in order for us to uh, uh, launch an, a diplomatic campaign around the world, uh, first, you saw what I think most of us would agree was pretty dramatic here in the United States. The rest of the world saw that, and now we're saying to them, this is what can happen to you. Unless you tow the Russian line, they're going to use all of these tools under the mask of a thing called Rosia Savodnia. And the sanctions that were imposed that you'll see in the fact sheet are the strongest possible sanctions this government puts on. They're full, uh, as Jim would know better, f blocking financial sanctions. So uh, we're exposing what they do in country after country around the world. 
We're using a strong uh, sanction tool. But remember, sanctions are a tool. They're not a goal. What's the goal? The goal is for the rest of the world, and remember, you've asked questions for Matt for months and months about you know, the global south and why there's not more support for Ukraine in this part of the Middle East or that part of Latin America or this part of Africa. Well, one of the reasons, not the only reason, but one of the reasons why so much of the world has not uh, been as fully supportive of Ukraine as you would think they would be, given that Russia has invaded Ukraine and violated rule number one of the international system, is because of the broad scope and reach of RT, where propaganda, disinformation, and lies are spread to millions, if not billions, of people around the world. What we're asking and what we're going to do, and Jim has warned me against this, but I'm going to do it anyway, is to use an analogy. Okay? It's only an analogy. It's not a precise comparison. When uh, the last administration decided to go after uh, the Huawei company for the risk of intelligence being drawn out of a legal telephone instrument, we took a look at that campaign uh, before we launched this. We tried to learn some lessons from it to try to help us figure out what's the best way over time to make countries around the world see the value uh, and the danger of, of, of uh, RT, which is technically a legal instrument, a television station, despite the lies and disinformation it's broadcasting, that has within it, and now we've shown you, and we'll show you in the fact sheet and in the things that I just said, covert operations, covert intelligence activities, acting as if they were a direct arm of the government. And now here's the fun part. They've admitted it. Go look at what the leader of, uh, uh, of RT has said. They have said they are operating under direct instruction of Vladimir Putin. That's what they say they're doing. And they're, we're saying they're fully integrated into the intelligence operations of the Russian government. And that's a big difference than our state-funded media. Believe you me, no one in this building gets to tell anyone at VOA, RFE, or RL what to say, do, or write. They ask us questions and we answer them. That's the difference between a state-funded media organization in a democracy and one in an authoritarian government. Uh, the leader of RT has admitted that that's what she does, and they do, and we've now given you enormous examples of how dangerous it is around the world, and I sure hope it meets your definition of something new. The crowdfunding effort that was uh, announced today, that was directed at a domestic Russian audience, and was it on Russian platforms? Is there any indication that this was on any U.S.-owned platforms? My, my understanding of that is it's on Russian platforms, but it's run by RT, uh, secretly. They don't say, this, this is an RT operation, send uh, by uh, UAVs from, and some of that we discovered were uh, UAVs purchased from the People's Republic of China in small amounts to send to the, uh, to the Russian army. So that's not what a TV station normally does. That's what, that's what a military uh, uh, entity does. And it's just another example of what we're trying to show you, that it is not just a, a, a fire hose, as the secretary put it, of disinformation, but a fully-fledged member of the intelligence apparatus and operation uh, uh, of the Russian government on the war in Ukraine. All right, Nick and then Kylie. Um, you guys uh, have, oh, sorry, the secretary highlighted the first sentence of the fact sheet, new information, much of which originates from RT employees. That language goes beyond what the Department of Justice said last week. So could you talk about some of the sourcing on this information? <laughs> and then on the crowdfunding program, uh, how do you know that that's not just the RT deputy editor-in-chief helping zealously the, the soldiers he believes are actually defending Russia? Um, how do you know it goes beyond that? And the PRC stuff, is that just dual use? Or are you alleging that those are PRC <coughs> weapons that actually went to Russian soldiers via RT? I'll try. Uh, that's a tough question, and you know it's a tough question. Normally, uh, unless you work over in Langley or in other intelligence uh, uh, facilities of this government, we don't normally tell you how we know something. Um, uh, suffice it to say 
as Secretary Blinken pointed to, one of the hallmarks of this administration, as you may have seen in Time Magazine, is the ability of uh, uh, our National Security Advisor, our Director of the CIA, and the Director of National Intelligence to downgrade information related to the war in Ukraine and how remarkable that was and how remarkable it's been and how remarkable it co will continue to be. Uh, suffice it to say that at the GEC I work with all members of this government. Uh, I have a military team, I have an intelligence team, I have State Department officials, and I have teams from other part of the government. This is government information. You can draw your own conclusions as to how much more specific, but I think what the Secretary was pointing to is that some of these things have been admitted themselves by the leaders of RT, and that doesn't mean that just because someone admitted something, it's not new information, because it's new when it's put in its proper context. And that's the word that we officials love, that you guys generally don't love, because it allows us to go on too long. But, but more seriously, the RT's leadership in its most recent interview has acknowledged that their job is to do what the Kremlin tells them to do. And we're giving you examples of what they're telling them to do that have nothing to do with broadcasting, even broadcasting lies and disinformation. Okay. Um, on the way, on the, on the China. On the weapons. Uh, yeah, yeah. So the significant thing, so I'd just say in short, no, we're not going to tell you more than the secretary said on who said what. Um, the, um, on the weapons, China is a major supplier. Much of the crowdsourcing, the thing that's significant is it was done covertly. So it wasn't just some, you know, employees putting on a, a telethon. And it was done covertly so they could purchase, in some cases, yes, individual arms. Um, so in this case, we have no indication that China knew that this was being directed by the Russian government. Um, or that the end users were Russian soldiers. So that that line we have across. And, and, it, and it was Chinese weapons, or it sounds like it was like Chinese drones and R and D. It's like more dual use. The, there were a, a, some individual soldiers' arms involved in the crowd forcing. Some of this equipment has been sourced from the PRC. That means that doesn't mean the PRC There's government good. knows to include reconnaissance drones made by PRC-based entities and R and D support in the production of said drones in coordination with the Russian Ministry of Defense. Uh, just one quick question on that, and then I have another question on the cyber unit. Um, so, is it is it the crowdfunding mechanism that is purchasing? Uh, these weapons sourced from China, or is it the Russian government that's using the funds that are collected mm, there know. to make the purchases? Yeah, we don't know that. You don't, don't know, know the that. answer to that. Okay. Um, and then the cyber unit with ties to Russian intelligence embedded in RT in 2023. Can you tell us which countries this unit embedded into RT inside of? And if you can't list them, just a, a, an approximate number of countries? Um, where this was an active unit inside of RT? Um, everything about this unit and its activities inside RT is extremely sensitive information, and I have to get my facts exactly right and not make a mistake here, so bear with me for a second. Um, as I understand it, the unit is a cyber intelligence gatherer, so it's using cyber tools to gather information and then use that information in some form. We've seen in our country and in other countries what happens when cyber units suck up information and then they leak it, for example, or they use it for other purposes. Um, it's my understanding that this is a global reach type of a capability, because remember the thing that makes all of this very, very difficult is that the information space is flat. It's not like you have to be inside uh, Russia or inside China or inside the United States to have an effect on China, Russia, or the United States. And so with the right kind of capabilities, sitting in the right location, we learned in our country what can happen from some people sitting at a beach in Macedonia, although there's no beach in Macedonia, but inside Macedonia, what they did in our country. So that's why the geographic point is not as relevant for cyber espionage. And uh, is that cyber unit embedded within RT still active at this time? I, I, I can't answer that. All right, we'll do one more, Camilla. 
Um, Peggy, can you give just an idea for, in layman's terms, a little bit what this looks like, the crowdfunding? Uh, I know you said it's in secret, and it, are we talking about like in secret on the dark web space rather than like a public GoFundMe thing? Can you just help us kind of? I will try to get you more information on that. Um, it's always funny when you're preparing this stuff what the thing is that you all decide to focus on, and I, I never get it right, no matter how many years I've been doing this business. Um, I personally don't think that's the most significant part of what RT is doing. Okay, it's just an example of what of how RT is operating as an arm of the government without using its name. It's an example of something that's done by cyber the cyber unit for example. But what RT is doing in Argentina in Germany, in France, in the countries when Jim came back on his, from his last trip and there were upcoming elections and they saw the ways in which Russian influence. The secretary talked about Moldova. I think that's probably the most important thing where we're seeing clear evidence that the RT is going to be used to try to manipulate an election and if they don't win the election, manipulate a crowd to try to generate violence uh, for the possibility of overthrowing. Uh, I think that's probably a lot more important than a few scopes for the soldiers in Ukraine. We were trying to give you an example, and obviously that's the one that you like the most. Can I ask one that's a bit more topical just for, for this week? Sure. Um, so uh, the, what happened this week with the debate uh, with a former president saying something? Oh, well, you know I can't talk very, about but, that. No, can I just, because this is for the GEC so as well. Have yeah. you seen any, have you seen any evidence, you said the team that you're working with across the interagency, any evidence of cats and dogs, stories about pets being eaten? You'd have Was to that just, amplified at all by a foreign I haven't party? seen that. Yeah. I haven't asked my guys to do that. We've been pretty busy on trying to get this thing done. Um, this, You'd be surprised how much work goes into these efforts. And let me just say, because uh, I think we should get the hook because we're too focused on crowdfunding and cats, um, uh, th that... that um, I want to thank Kerry Gu sitting in the back of the room and all the people at the GEC. This is something that's been put together over many, many, many weeks and months and a lot of people put their heart and soul into this sort of work to be able to get it available to you in all these details so that you can then question me and Jim about cats and crowdfunding. Um, uh, but, but this is going to be a long-term campaign and that's the point of the analogy to Huawei. That, that's something that began under the Trump administration, continued on the Biden administration. We are going to be talking, the secretary will be talking, the president will be talking, assistant secretaries of state like Jim and especially his colleagues in Latin America, in Africa, in Asia are going to be working with their colleagues to try to show all of those countries that right now broadcast with no uh, restriction or control RT uh, and allow them free access to their countries, which I do believe, unfortunately and sadly, has had a deleterious effect on the uh, views of the rest of the world about a war that should be an open and shut case. All right, thank you. Thank you. They're playing our music. Thank you all. <laughs> thank you. All right, um, warning from the top, as Matt comes in, we're gonna have to make this a rapid fire round because I have a meeting at 2.15. Um, but, uh, Okay. Let's get started. Um, Nick. You won't want to discuss anything specifically before the president meets with Russia, British Prime Minister, so let me try and ask you a question that you can't answer. Um, Ukraine has been arguing, as we've been talking about, that, of the utility of long-range fires into Ukraine. Uh, it has cited specific targets. It's cited an overall idea of how long-range fires would fit into the broader strategy of victory. So, in general, is that a message that the U.S. has been receiving? Uh, and is that a message that will be discussed between uh, British officials, American officials, obviously this week's already been, but going forward when it comes to making a decision about So, of course, we've been having those discussions with our Ukrainian colleagues. That's one of the things that the Secretary talked about with President Zelensky, uh, with the Prime Minister and with the Foreign Minister, came up in all of his meetings in Ukraine uh, two days ago, and they're making the case, as they have done consistently since the course of this campaign, where you've seen different times where they've come to make the case for different capabilities or different tactics or di other different ways in which we could support them. Uh, our job always 
always is to listen to the case that they make and then think about, uh, as you may have heard the Secretary say when he got this question, I don't know, multiple times while he was in the region, um, both what it is that we can make available to them, uh, how they can use it, uh, what the long-term strategy behind using those capabilities would be, and then we come back and, and um, uh, discuss that with our colleagues here, and ultimately the President makes a decision. Uh, and, and so, um, the. As you know, the Secretary had with him the Foreign Minister, David Lammy, and uh, who I know is accompanying the Prime Minister. I'm sure that'll be one of the things uh, that'll be discussed in the meeting today. I do think um, it is important to note that is not the only topic on the agenda today. We have a, a, a long standing bilateral relationship with the United Kingdom. There are a number of things to talk about uh, in those meetings. Um, Ukraine is an important part of them. It was, it was a, a large focus of our meetings uh, in the UK, um, uh, which the Secretary traveled to before Ukraine, but there are other things we talked about too, the war in the Middle East and any, uh, other num any and number of other topics. And, and uh, would a U.S. decision about American long-range weapons, would that be made in concert or independently, <clears throat> perhaps, in a British long-range use of fires inside of... I don't want to speak to uh, any hypotheticals. As of yet, we have not changed our policy. It's something we discussed with our allies. Uh, it's just something we discussed with our Ukrainian partners, and I, I um, don't have any announcements to make today. Uh, let, me, let me go to Matt first. <laughs> Matt, can can we something is, that you might actually have be able to answer? You can try. Okay. Uh, you've <laughs> seen the, the convictions in Congo? Uh, I have. Uh, okay. So you could. Oh, I right. no, I, that, I didn't know you were. Okay, I you have. Want, yeah, I, right. I, I'll, I, I'll send that off to our Kinshasa bureau. Yeah, yeah we've seen them. So you, you have anything to say about them? So um, we have seen that a military court in the Democratic Republic of Congo sentenced a, a number of defendants, including U.S. citizens, to death um, for alleged involvement in the May 19th attacks against the government. We understand that the legal process in the DRC allows for defendants to appeal the court's decision. Uh, embassy staff have been attending these proceedings as they've uh, uh, gone through the process so far and will continue to attend the proceedings and follow the developments closely. Right, do you believe the proceedings so far have been fair? I don't want to pass judgment on the proceedings so far because we are still in the middle of the legal process. They do have the right to appeal. We're going to continue in stay, to stay engaged in monitoring uh, and speaking to the defendants and, and their attorneys. All right. And sticking on court cases, um, if uh, a former, I believe former, um, diplomatic security office officer uh, pleaded guilty today, charges on January 6th. Do you have any Anything to say? Uh, I, the only thing I will say about that is we fully support the work by our colleagues at the Department of Justice to hold anyone responsible for violations of law on that horrific day accountable for those violations. Thank you. Yeah, Jillian. Do you guys have a response to what Putin said yesterday, which is basically that if this is a follow up on, on Ukraine, if there yeah. were missile strikes, you view that as NATO entering into a direct war with Russia, including the U.S.? Just so a few things. Yeah, a few things about that. So number one, that's very similar to things that he has said uh, over the course of the past two and a half years. We've sen seen him make similar statements about uh, things that the United States and its allies and partners, not all of whom are NATO members, some of uh, whom are other uh, partners of ours around the world. Um, so it's not really a new statement by President Putin, but of course we pay close attention to everything that he says. I would say President Putin is the one who could end this war today if he wanted to. The only reason we are even having a discussion at all about the provision of American capabilities to Ukraine and the provision of capabilities by our NATO allies and the coalition of 50 countries that we've assembled around the world to Ukraine is because Putin continues to press this illegal war, that he continues to try to forcibly take territory of Ukraine. So if the president of Russia doesn't want to have a conversation about what capabilities we provide to Ukraine, there's a very easy way to uh, get to the end of that conversation, and that's for him to end this illegal war. But do you dispute his... Uh, I don't know, oh, the other that, that, you that, that NATO, of course, no, of, cor of, uh, of course, it would not be an entering of the United States. We have been very clear that uh, uh, the United States is not going to take part in this war. Uh, we're not going to put boots on the ground. We are, however, going to continue to to equip Ukraine so it can defend itself. We're going to continue to work with a coalition of countries around the world to help Ukraine defend itself. All right. Now, uh, can I just Tom. sort of follow up on, on on the issue of the British? Visit. I mean, how would you characterize how closely aligned you are with the British government position on the issue of long range missiles? Because it's fairly clear that the British and the French and some others are more sympathetic to 
President Zelensky is pleased to be able to use these weapons inside Russia. So how would you define where, you know, how closely aligned you are with the British? So I don't want to get into the details of both private and ongoing diplomatic conversations, especially ahead of a conversation that's going to happen uh, here in another hour, hour and a half or so uh, at the White House. I will say that we are very closely aligned with Britain on the overall objectives, the uh, overall outcome that we want to see. You heard the secretary and the foreign minister both speak to that in a press conference in Ukraine. We share the ex exact same objectives, and we continue to discuss with them the best way to achieve those objectives, the best way to make sure that Ukraine ultimately wins this war. That's an ongoing discussion, as the Secretary said, uh, in Ukraine. Um, and I think believe, as the, as the Foreign Minister said, both of us would go back and talk with our respective governments about what we heard from uh, our Ukrainian partners, and then we will confer with each other as we confer with our other NATO allies just, uh, and, would, and make decisions based on those uh, consultations going forward. Would you prefer that there is coordination on these permissions? I mean, if the Europeans are to sort of unilaterally give permission to use their long-range weapons, is that something you have a problem with? So, we will continue to coordinate with them. Every country ultimately has to make its own decisions about how they want to support Ukraine. And that's something uh, that every country has the ability to do. But we do consult with each other, especially with our close NATO allies. Uh, ultimately, this is an issue that um, uh, is something we want to work together on, and we'll continue to do that. Alex. Thank you, Matt. Just to uh, press you a little bit on, more on uh, Nick's question. Your response doesn't scream urgency, but uh, knowing what you know about Iranian missiles, you know, delivery of Iranian missiles uh, to Russia, and the White House said that they're going to be employed within weeks. What is the suggestion, suggestion to, to Ukrainians? Just sit back and wait? Alex, so time. you and I have had this debate a number of times before <laughs> um, when it comes to any one capability that we might provide. And I would urge you, as always, to take this in a larger context um, and look at the overall support that we have provided to Ukraine since day one, really since before day one. We were providing Ukraine with security assistance before the, the uh, February 24th, uh, 2022 invasion. And we have continued to provide them tens of billions of dollars in assistance. And we have continued to adapt and adjust adjust our capabilities that we provide them and adjust, adapt and adjust the assistance that we provide them related to, to, to the evolving situation on the battleground. However, we're going to be deliberate about that. We're going to want to think about how it fit every uh, step that we take fits into a long-term strategy. And Alex, ultimately, I would ask that you judge us by our results, by our actions, and by the overall assistance that we provide. And I think our track record in that regard speaks for itself. One but, more, but, and then, but, oh, 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 because I have limited time, one more, then I'm going to move on. Thanks so much. Just to clarify, what gives you confidence that the air defense system you have provided so far will actually protect them against Iranian drones, which will you know, hit you know, within weeks? I'm just saying. Okay, so, what the White House so you mean Iranian ballistic missiles yeah. or Iranian yeah. drones? Both. Iranian ballistic missiles. So we continue to work with them to strengthen their air defense systems. We have provided them air defense systems. Um, uh, a number of other countries have provided them air defense systems. We're going to continue to work to bolster them as well as continue their, to bolster their capability to, um, uh, to take on uh, 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 Russian capabilities to launch those attacks in the first place. Uh, Kylie, go ahead. Just to follow up on, on the questions here. Um, how much is uh, Russia's procurement of Iran's uh, short-range uh, military capabilities, which frees up their long-range capabilities, impacting your guys' uh, decision-making here? So it is absolutely something that we take under consideration, both for the um, strategic purpose that you point out, that it does allow Russia to use some of its more long-range capabilities to strike further. They don't have to use them at the front lines because they can use these short-range Iranian ballistic missiles. They can use them to conduct long-term strikes targeting Kyiv, uh, targeting potentially Lviv. You've seen them targeting civilian infrastructure, not military infrastructure with those long-range strikes. So certainly it is something uh, that we take into consideration. We also take into consideration the fact that it is very much an escalation by Russia. It's very much an escalation by Iran for them to end this, uh, uh, to begin to provide uh, these capabilities to Russia. So it is absolutely something that we consider uh, in making our calculations. And, and the White House said today that we shouldn't expect any major announcements after the meeting with Biden and Prime Minister Starmer today. Can you give us some sense of when there might be a final decision on this? It's been you know, discussed for months now. It seems to have come to a boil this week. Are we looking at next week for a possible announcement on this? Uh, I do not want to either preview or put a timetable on any type of announcements other than to say this is something that we have gone through from time to time when you um, there uh, will be a focus on any one particular weapon system or any one particular capability. And as always, I would just urge you to look at the way that we have consistently handled this, which is to be deliberate, to be smart, and to be strategic in about um, uh, what we provide and when we provide it um, uh, to our Ukrainian partners. 
Martin. So, okay, Jannie, then a couple more we have to wrap. You may have the quick questions. Russia is warning of the use of nuclear weapons, and North Korean Kim Jong un is also ordering the mass production of nuclear weapons. North Korea is trying to get interfere in the U.S. presidential election. How do you predict North Korea and Russia's intervene, intervention in the U.S. presidential election? So we have been made very clear that we oppose any country uh, taking steps to interfere in our democratic process here, uh, and that we will take steps to hold accountable any country that does so. And you've seen us take actions uh, in the past. Uh, on North Korea, yeah, a little bit more relevant. Do you have anything to say about the, the uranium? No, we saw. We obviously saw the video. It doesn't change our over policy, our, our, our overall policy. It's a, a new video. I don't know that it represents any new, bless you, any new uh, uh, capability um, by the uh, North Korean regime. We are going to continue to make clear that we will defend our uh, uh, South Korean and Japanese allies, and we'll continue to work for the full denuclearization denuclear of the Korean Peninsula. Do you think the North Korea is a nuclear test is imminent or just? Uh, I, 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 I do not want to make any predictions on that. Gita, go ahead. Thank you. Um, on the eve of the anniversary of Masa Amini's death in Iran and the start of the Women Life Freedom Movement, um, the UN fact-finding mission has issued a its latest report on the situation of human rights in Iran. Um, in short, it says that suppression of women's and girls' rights has intensified, and it is crushing women's um, <coughs> activism. The mission suggests, and I quote, states must continue to place the situation of women and girls in the Islamic Republic of Iran high on the international agenda. I was wondering what the Biden administration is doing in this regard. Sure. So uh, as you have heard us say before, um, Masamini's story did not end with her death. She inspired a historic uh, movement that has impacted Iran and influenced people uh, across the globe who are advocating for gender equality, respect for human rights, and particularly the respect for human rights inside Iran. So uh, that report is absolutely right. We have seen, continue to see a crackdown on women and women's rights in Iran. And I would just say the new president of Iran has uh, uh, in, at various times signaled that he wants to change his approach and wants to reach out to the West and have a, have a different relationship with the rest, West. There are obviously a number of actions he could take in that regard when it comes to Iran's destabilizing activities outside of its own borders. But one of the actions he could take would be to stop the crackdown on women and women's rights inside Iran's borders. All right, well, uh, well, let me take one more and then I really do have to go because I have a, a meeting with the boss. Uh, one question on the killing of Turkish American activists, yeah. uh, Aisha Norezgi Egi. Uh, recent reports dispute um, Israeli account that she was shot accidentally. Um, given the, you know, what happened with the Shirin Abu Agles case, uh, is, I mean, uh, is the U.S. reconsidering its stance on the Israeli narrative on this? And uh, is it the U.S. still the U.S. position that that uh, you are waiting for the results of the Israeli in investigation instead of uh, launching a U.S.-led mm -hmm. independent investigation as demanded by Aisha Nur's family? Yeah, let me say this: we have uh, <coughs> been briefed on the results of the preliminary investigation by uh, the government of Israel, and they have told us they are conducting a full uh, criminal investigation. We are going to wait to pass any judgments about what steps ought to take uh, ought to occur next until we have. Uh, in terms of from an investigative standpoint until we've received the results of that investigation. We think they ought to be, uh, that investigation needs to be thorough, it needs to be prompt, and it needs to be transparent, and then we'll make any uh, determinations at the conclusion of that investigation. But that said, as the Secretary said earlier this week, even knowing what we know now, we know enough to know that the Israeli security forces need to make changes in the way that they are operating in the West Bank, because you have now seen uh, not just one, but uh, two American citizens killed uh, as a result of what the Israeli forces them or the, the Israeli forces admit themselves were fire from, you know, from uh, uh, in this case, the IDF. So it's very clear that the, they do need to make changes in their rules of engagement. We're, we're going to continue to impress, uh, to, to press them on that. And that, I think, is a different question um, than the, the one about the investigation. But my point being, we know enough now to know that there are changes that need to be and made. Uh, just a quick follow-up. Uh, what changes do you expect from Israel and what consequences uh, will, will there be any consequences for Israel? So, for killing so, a U.S. citizen? So, 
we want to see changes to the rules of engagement. First of all, with respect to consequences, you do need to wait to see the results of the investigation to know whether there need to be any specific criminal uh, criminal consequences for the, per the, the individuals involved. It's important that that investigation play out. And as, as I said, it ought to be uh, prompt and thorough and transparent. But ultimately, when it comes to the changes in the rules of engagement, what we have said or what we have seen, and you heard the Secretary speak to this, is we have seen a number of occasions when Israeli security forces have stood by when there were acts of settler violence, when they haven't intervened, we need to, we want to see them uh, intervene and stop those acts of settler violence. Uh, we have seen reports of uh, excessive use of force by Israeli security forces against uh, Palestinians, and now we've seen the death of two American citizens, and we want that to end. And that's why we want to see the changes to the rules of engagement. And with that, I'm sorry I do have to wrap for today. See you guys next week. Thank you.